A show of hands, who watched the Olympics? Okay. Who moved their schedules around to catch events live or in prime time? Okay. Who went to the Olympics? That's right, Winnikies. They went over to Paris. They actually got to be there. And so it is your duty to talk to them afterwards, to hear what it was like to be there and see some of these events live. I did not go over to Paris, but I was glued to the television. Um, I, we, Megan and I made sure to catch m a lot of the gymnastics. Shout out Simone Biles. Um, and I, I love basketball, and so I tried to watch as much of it as I could. Did anybody catch that gold medal match against France where, where Steph was just drilling three after three after three against France? Or in the last moments to clinch the game, hitting the three over the double team to get us gold? I was, out, I was yelping as I was watching. I was so excited. And who didn't feel a little bit like Indiana Pacers' own Tyrese Halliburton, who posted a photo of himself after the game and said, uh, when you ain't do nothing on the group project, but you still get an A because he didn't get a minute in the final two games. But that's okay. That is okay. He was there. Olympians train for years for their chance to compete against the best of the best in their field, right? So they're going to train through all sorts of weather. They're going to work through injury, through sickness, you name it, all for the chance of Olympic glory. And I find it fascinating. It's actually called Olympic glory. That's something that even the Olympics embrace, right? They, they held this whole video series, Road to Glory, what is this glory that everybody who is competing in the Olympics is, is working their whole lives to get? Our walk through Exodus, this idea around freedom this summer, it has been building to the culmination in this passage around the idea of glory. Is it something that we seek to get? Or is it something to give? Okay, so glory is this multifaceted concept. All right, so it encapsulates such things as honor, praise, renown. Okay, but it also touches on this aspect of beauty, right? It's something to be adored. But then again, you kind of look at it a different way. It carries with it this worth, right? The, the worth that something exudes, right? It, it kind of gives off this vibe of wonder and awe. Something has glory. But it isn't even limited to accomplishment, but it extends on to the being, right? Glory, glory is a lot. There's a lot that comes with Glory. Now, this isn't a bite-sized definition because I don't think actually glory can be summarized so succinctly. Um, but hold that broad idea of glory in mind as we jump into our text. We are going to run through about six chapters, Exodus 35 through Exodus 40. If you want to follow along, go into our sermon notes. You can scan that. Or if this is gone by the time that you wanted to scan it, it's, it's on the back of your uh, connect card that's in your seat. So follow along there with the passages that we'll hit. Last week, Pastor Russell covered the, the horrible instance of the Israelites worshiping this golden calf, this false idol that they had made from the gold that God had given them from the Egyptians as they left Egypt. So this gift that was for them, they then used to give glory to this false God. Were they left in their shame? Did they remain only with the sin that they had pursued? Jump with me. Chapter 35, verse 4, like Cassie read. So Moses said to all the congregation of the people of Israel, this is the thing that the Lord has commanded. Take from among you a contribution to the Lord. Whoever is of a generous heart, 
Let him bring to the Lord's contribution gold, silver, and bronze, blue and purple scarlet yarns and fine twined linen, goat's hair, mm, goat's hair, tanned ram skins and goat skins, acacia wood, oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense, and onyx stones and stones for setting for the ephod and for the breast piece. Moses has been sent by God to say, you have a second chance. You have the second chance. On the heels of making a covenant with Israel, God has invited Israel to participate in the creation of the tabernacle, right? So instead of using all that came from Egypt to hoard the glory for themselves, as they had done, the people of Israel were now asked to give glory to the Lord. Not to hoard, but to give. Jump with me to verse 20. And then all the congregation of the people of Israel departed from the presence of Moses, and they came. Everyone whose heart stirred him and everyone whose spirit moved him and brought the Lord's contribution to be used for the tent of meeting and for all its service and for the holy garments. So they came, both men and women, all who were of a willing heart. Note that it keeps saying of this willing heart. It wasn't a requirement. It was a free will offering. All right. They, they were invited and they jumped at the chance. So they came, uh, all who were willing of a willing heart brought brooches and earrings and signet rings and armlets, all sorts of gold objects, every man dedicating an offering of gold to the Lord. And everyone who possessed uh, blue or purple scarlet yarns uh, or fine linen or goat's hair or tanned ram skins or goat skins, they brought them. Again, I hope you are hearing, they're bringing the opulent stuff. They are bringing the best stuff of the best to the Lord. And everyone who possessed blue, nope, I already read that. Verse 24, everyone who could make a contribution of silver or bronze brought it to the Lord's contribution. And everyone who possessed acacia wood of any use in the work brought it. And every skillful woman spun with her hands and they all brought what they had spun in blue and purple and scarlet yarns and, and fine twined or fine twined linen. Again, they're getting involved. It's not just this contribution. It's this intent. We are going to give the best. We are going to make the best. It is going to the Lord. All the women whose heart stirred them used their skill spun the goat's hair. And the leaders, Right? So not just the, the commoners, not just the everybody's. It's, it's the everybody's everybody's. Even the top people, the leaders, brought onyx stones and stones to be set for the ephod and for the breast piece and the spices for the oil, for the light, for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense. And all the men and women, the people of Israel, whose heart moved them to bring anything for the work that the Lord had commanded by Moses to be done, brought it as a free will offering to the Lord. Everyone, I hope that you got through. The reason I had, we, we read through all of this is to see how many people bought in, how many people wanted to jump at the opportunity. This, this free will offering was from their heart and they could not wait to give God glory. And so they brought all of this and they laid it at the feet of Moses. They laid it at the feet of the craftsmen who were about to make the stuff. And they brought so much that in Exodus 36, 6, it says, So Moses gave command and word was proclaimed throughout the camp. Let no man or woman do anything more for the contribution for the sanctuary. So the people were restrained from bringing for the material that they had was sufficient to do all the work and more. Their hearts were stirred to give to overflowing, to excess almost, right? Okay, so using current values, if you jump to chapter 38 and you look, it, it amount just metal, gold, silver, bronze, over $63 million dollars. Okay, in, in current terms, that's how much they brought. That's not even counting all of the oils, all of the linens, all of the wood. It, it is over 63 million just 
in the metals alone. This was a beautiful, beautiful contribution. And what a picture. What a picture, right? The people first took all of the gold that they had and they hoarded it and they kept it to themselves. And then they were called to give to God and they gave God glory to overflowing, to excess that Moses and the craftsmen said, hey, cut it off. Please stop. Too much adoration is happening here. Game off. So who gets the glory? God gets the glory. For all that God had given them, for all the plunder that he had sent them out of Egypt with, all of it was directed to be used for his glory. Now I want you to take a pause. When we think about Israel, right, that this comes on the heels of the passages Pastor Russell covered last week, when Israel had hoarded those things and used their goods, used their things that they liked for themselves. And in this passage, it's flipped 180. And God uses it, this same stuff, God uses it for his glory. Is there anything that you look back in your life and you have a regret about? Is there anything that you look back and feel shame over? Okay, do you have that thing in mind? What could it look like if you take that event, that item, that scenario, and what would it look like if it were turned towards God and you gave him glory for the ways that he hasn't defined you by that action, that moment, that scenario. Even the things that have ruined us by sin can be turned to glorify God, just like he did here. Okay, let's jump back to the story. Moses has called for this free will offering. People have tripped all over themselves to be able to participate. But who's actually going to take the piles of wonderful things and make them into something that is beautiful. Go to Exodus 35, 30. And then Moses said to the people of Israel, see, the Lord has called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And he has filled him with the spirit of God, with skill, with intelligence, with knowledge, and with all craftsmanship, to devise artistic designs to work in gold and silver and bronze, in cutting stones for setting and in carving wood for, every, for work in every skilled craft. And he has inspired him to teach both him and Aholiab, the son of Ahisamach of the tribe of Dan. And he has filled them with skill to do every sort of work done by an engraver or by a designer or by an embroiderer in blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twin linen or by a weaver by any sort of workman or skilled designer, Bezalel and Aholiab, and every craftsman in whom the Lord has put skill and intelligence to know how to work in any work, how to do any work in the construction of the sanctuary shall work in accordance with all that the Lord has commanded. The incomparable beauty that the tabernacle was to be built with, how, how it's supposed to look, how it's supposed to shine, it comes at the hands of Bezalel and Aholiab. Now, in the description that I just read, did they win a contest to build the tabernacle? Did they compete to show themselves worthy? No, <laughs> right? The skills that they have, it is so clear, they were given to them by God and he chose them. Now, I want just, if you have that passage in front of you, look at it. Take note of the different things that God gave Bezalel and Aholiab. These are gifts from the Lord. 
He filled him or them with his spirit. Now, small level research, this is not the Holy Spirit, but it's like the essence of, like when you say somebody has the American spirit, right? Okay, so, so God gave them his spirit. He filled them with his spirit. He gave them skill, intelligence, knowledge, the ability to do all craftsmanship. And Moses thinks maybe that's not enough of a description. What type of craftsmanship? So glad you asked. Devising artistic designs, ability to work in gold, ability to work in silver, ability to work in bronze, the ability to cut all of these precious gemstones so that they could be set just right in the holy garments. The ability to carve wood, just in case you missed it, we're going to hit it again, all craftsmanship. But what more does that look like? Well, he also gave them the ability to teach. Isn't that fun? Right in the middle of all of this, the ability to teach. The fact that he gave them skill and the ability to pass on that knowledge to others. The ability to teach is a gift from the Lord. The ability to engrave, the ability to design, the ability to embroider all these different types of linens and the ability to weave. This is a dramatic list, right? So what's your, what's my, what's our typical reaction when we interact with a talented or a skilled person? What do we do? We heap praise on them. We adore them. We extol them for all of their wonderful ways and all the fun that they get to do and have. We aim to give them glory. We aim to give them glory. Now, raise your hand if you can do something kind of well. Yes, I did ask it like that. Can you raise your hand if you can do something kind of well? Okay, that should be most people's hands up. I promise you are better at most things than you think. Now, again, I ask for hands, not for people who've done like the 10,000 hours on, on one thing. I'm not asking if you've been able to make a profession with this skill, just can you do something well? Okay, everybody, most hands, or at least people are trying to be like, I guess I can kind of do something. I can raise my hand well. So <laughs> you've do, you, you count, I promise. So where did that skill come from, right? Was it from the environment that you were raised in? Was it from hard work and sweat equity? Maybe for you, is it right place, right time? Learn the skills. I want you to take it from there. Let's, let's take it to the next step. Not where did it come from? What's the skill for? What will it accomplish when you do the thing kind of well? Who gets the glory when you do that thing kind of well? In the case of Bezalel and Aholiab, their skills are remarkable, but their remarkable skills are not for the sake of praising them, adoring them, extolling them because of all that they can do. Instead, it's been given to them so that others can give God more glory. Now, I want to invite you to think of all of those things that, even raising your hand, that you can do kind of well, okay? Now, it's a little silly. Think about the things that you can actually do well, like very well. The things that you are proud of, the things that you are passionate about. Those things are gifts from God that he has given you to bring him glory. Those things are gifts from God that he has given you to bring him glory. So when, when Bezalel and Aholiab and all these other craftsmen who helped actually construct the temple, right? It wasn't just two men who did the whole thing. When they made all the ornate pieces, all of the curtains and the walls and, and the holy garments, everything that belonged in the tabernacle, the awe wasn't directed towards them. The awe wasn't directed towards the things that they made, but instead it was turned Godward. So who gets the glory? God gets the glory. God gets the glory. Okay, so from the beginning of Exodus 36 through the end of Exodus 39, 
Moses details all of the tabernacle construction. So all the furniture, the elaborate priestly garments, it's all there. Russell actually gave a great description of what those furniture pieces were and what they represented the other week. Um, So certainly if you missed that, go check out that message. But if you're like, I know there's got to be something more about this whole tabernacle thing. I really want to invite you. Uh, The Bible Project has two podcasts in particular. Uh, One deals with the tabernacle and then another just deals with the tabernacle furniture, right? And it's over two hours. So I'm not covering that here, but I want to encourage you, go and check that out. There are links in the QR code in the sermon notes and then Um, Emily will put them on YouTube or in the podcast notes later. If you want to click those, check those out, please. I really want to encourage you. The Lord has built so much into what it looks like and what it is pointing to. And we just don't have time for it today. So, okay, so we're jumping ahead. Chapter 40, the tabernacle is now complete. It has been built just as God commanded Moses. It says that Moses did things just as God commanded 18 times <laughs> over the course of this. So if you see something repeated twice or three times in scripture, that's usually a sign to like maybe pay attention. 18 times he did what he was commanded. Okay, so I promised God, I followed. So how did God respond? How did God respond to the building of the tabernacle? Chapter 40, verse 34. And then the cloud covered the tent of meeting. When you see tent of meeting, that also is the tabernacle. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle throughout all their journeys. Whenever the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the people of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, they did not set out that day till it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day and fire was in it. I love that. The fire was in it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. Now, I don't know about you, When I come to scripture, often what stands out to me is what is not there. What's missing? This incredible piece of functional art. So it's towards God. So it's functional religious art, right? The entire nation participated in its construction. And when it is all finished, when it is all said and done, there's no party. There's no tour. There are no instructions for a tribe by tribe walkthrough so that everybody can just really appreciate how great it looks. What does the text tell us? It tells us that all of this was building to God's glorious presence coming into the people. It all built to God coming down in our midst. Remember all the way back at the beginning of Exodus, Moses kept going into Pharaoh and telling him, these people need to be freed from Egypt. Why? Let my people go that they may serve me. That's what God wanted. Let my people go that they may serve me. God freed Israel so that they could worship him. It was always... It was always about Israel giving God all the glory. From the start, it was about God's glory. But it was so much more than that. God was worthy of their awe, of their wonder, of their honor, of their praise, of their adoration. He was worth all that they could possibly give him. And his glory came down in their midst. His presence filled the tabernacle to the utmost. He was there. 
he was there. So who gets the glory? Well, God gets the glory. But here at the end, God gets the glory and he brings it to us. All of Exodus has been building to this and it's not just giving him glory, but it is his presence coming here. So Exodus chapter 40, we see God's glory comes. He fills the tabernacle. It sits by day as a massive cloud and by night with an unquenchable fire. Side note, I just can't get over this visual. Can you imagine being an Israelite and looking over to the tabernacle and the inside is glowing? It is glowing with the fire. It, probably not talking candlelight, right? There is something massive going on and it doesn't burn everything up. Could it have been like the burning bush? I'm not trying to say that's what scripture is saying. I like asking questions. It, they saw it by day and it didn't burn up the tabernacle. And they said, God's glory is there. God is present here and I can see him. Jump forward. Second Chronicles chapter seven. Israel has now many, many hundred years later, they have now built the temple and at the temple's completion, God comes down he has a permanent place now, right? The tabernacle can get packed up, taken on. The temple was not something that got packed up. It stayed. And God filled that place with his glory. But there's more. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 14, in the prophets, Habakkuk said, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. As the waters cover the sea, waters have a lot to do with the sea. If you're, if you're missing that, I'm just going to point that out. The glory of the Lord will cover the earth in the same way that seas exist as seas. That is the goal. God's heart was to bring his glory, not to just a place, not to just a people, but to the world. And so how would he do it? How would God accomplish this? It's not going to be building an even better structure in the Middle East. That's not the plan. It was never the plan. God's glory was seen when he came to earth in human form. Jesus Christ was fully God. All right. So, so every bit of glory was contained in him, but he was also fully man. At the beginning of John chapter one, Russell cited this early on in our series. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That word dwelt also is translated tabernacled among us. And the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. He tabernacled among us. But God didn't stop there. It didn't end there, right? So the moment that Jesus, the God man, the moment that he died on the cross, Matthew chapter 27, verse 51a, it says, and behold, the curtain of the temple, the thing that separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple, it was torn in two from the top to the bottom. It was ripped. His glory couldn't be contained in the temple. At the death of Jesus, God says, I am now among all of you. The completed sacrifice of Jesus on the cross led to the promise of the dwelling of the Holy Spirit the tabernacling of the Holy Spirit in us, those who have placed our faith in Jesus as Lord. So Paul says, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in you? It isn't just God in a tabernacle 
filling it with his glory. It's not just God in a temple filling it with his glory. It's not even just Jesus, God Almighty, coming to earth. He has a plan, and it is to fill you with the Holy Spirit and bring his glory to the world. That is how God's plan is getting carried out. For his glory to spread, it's through you. It's through you. It's through you. It's through you. It's through every single one of us that are in Christ. To those who have believed the good news that Jesus is Lord, we have been redeemed and we have been sent into the world as a kingdom of priests to take his glory to everyone that we know, every place that we go, so that more and more can give glory to God. John's praise in the book of Revelation, right at the end, it is a perfect close to God's plan for freedom all along. Chapter 1, verse 5, B, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. God freed the Israelites so that they could give him glory. Jesus came in glory to make us a kingdom of priests who bring his glory to the world over. We have been freed to bring glory to God. We have been freed to give glory to God. So the question I want to leave you pondering before we get to our calls to action. Do you spend more energy and effort around seeking glory or giving glory to God? Do you spend more effort around seeking glory or giving glory to God? As the band makes their way forward, I want to, I want to have you reflect on our calls to action. Final one for the series. If you spend more energy seeking glory, have you truly given your allegiance to Jesus as Lord? Is he the Lord of your life? So if not, I invite you to repent, right? to turn away from seeking glory and move towards giving him the glory that he deserves second thing I really want to encourage you take time to reflect this week take time to reflect that that can be through prayer that can be journaling that can be a prayer walk um, think about one place just one place in your life that you know that you can see God's glory thank him thank him for showing up in your life and revealing to you that glory of his and the third thing, if you are somebody that gives glory to God, that's your aim, that's your intent, what's a tangible thing that you can do this week to pass that glory on to someone else where you live, learn, work, and play, right? What does that look like? It could be giving a meal to somebody. It could be having a meal with somebody. Okay? It, it can be a word of encouragement, a, a listening ear. There are, the options are endless. But what is something that you can do to pass God's glory on to somebody? Write down one idea there before the day is done. 